and just want to say welcome again. My name is Tom. I'm one of the leaders here at Hope City, and particular welcome to friends and family who are joining us online. There we go. Repenting. Outside the cultural bubble of Christianity, it's quite possibly a foreign concept to your ears. Maybe it's something that you think might belong in a history book, or maybe in another world, a sort of fantasy novel. I wonder this morning whether you can tell me in three words or less what you think repenting means. Now, Helen's going to pop Slido on the screen, and this might work, it might not. Uh, we're having a little techie things. There it is. So if you want to grab the QR code, if you're joining us online, uh, I think the link should be there. It should work just the same. And uh, yeah, just say in three words or less, what do you think repenting means? And I'll give you 20 seconds to get started there. And uh, we'll go back to the main slides just for now, Helen. But uh, We'll, we'll have a look at the results in a little while. So um, we'll just leave it there for now. In 1170, King Henry II of England was locked in a stalemate with his archbishop, Thomas Becket. The two had been friends, but over the course of the previous decade, things had come to a head. Henry sent four of his knights to Canterbury to arrest Becket. But instead, they hacked him to death with swords. The historical picture of Henry's motivations is a bit unclear, I think it's safe to say, and there was debate in the country about whether the king had called for someone's murder. What we do know is that Henry went through a series of public phases of repentance over Becket's death. He didn't just say sorry to God or to the royal court. He went through a very public period of repentance. Picture the king of England stripping down to a plain rough wool shirt, walking barefoot through Kent into the town of Canterbury where he was whipped repeatedly as he entered the cathedral. What Henry was following was in a sense a set program, something as old at least as the kings of Israel when they needed to repent for sins they'd committed. The idea was that committing sin required an outward display of confession and repentance. It was public and it was costly. Flash forward to today and I might, if you'll permit me, I might be a little bit controversial here. Can you imagine this kind of behavior from our political leaders in a world where politicians hold parties just after they've told the public to stay home and say, eh? in a world where leaders insist that they weren't standing in the White House encouraging a mob of protesters to storm the Capitol building, in a world where a giant series of curious WhatsApp texts were mysteriously deleted. I think we've lost a cultural sense as to what it is to demonstrate repentance. And I want you to keep this in mind as we read through our passage this morning. And Zoe's going to come up and read that passage for us now. If you've got a blue Bible, it's on page 976. Over to you, Zoe. <laughs> then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, Will you not be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Thanks very much, Zoe. So, really straightforward, uncomplicated passage this morning, yeah? <laughs> There's our results. I said we'd come back to it. 
let's see what we've got here. So I think the bigger uh, ones are things that multiple people have said, turning around, turning direction, asking for forgiveness, acknowledging your faults, changing paths, turning to God, saying sorry for sinning. Um, this is good. This is, it's helpful to see what sorts of ideas and concepts we're bringing from the Bible and to the Bible. Remember, we don't come to the Bible as clean slates. We're bringing with it our own experiences, our own understanding, our own struggles, our own failures, and our own prejudices. They're all coming with us. And that's why we need to be careful to be aware of our own blinders. And it can be a helpful way to avoid coming to the Bible looking simply to reinforce our own opinions and perspectives. We're going to try and define, uh, feel free to go back to the slides, Helen. We're going to try and define and deal with some tough words from Jesus yet again. Woe, repent, sackcloth, ashes. I'm going to do my best to unpack what I think is going on, both at and below the surface in this bit of teaching from Jesus. And I think we need to start with a big disclaimer. We absolutely need to understand this section in its proper literary genre, namely prophecy. This is a prophetic passage. I wonder what comes to mind when I mention the term prophecy. Any volunteers? You can just shout this one out. What's prophecy? Weird. Weird people, yeah. <laughs> like strange clothes, strange diets. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Messenger, yeah. Anybody else? God's postman. God's postman. Oh, I like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anybody else? Foretelling. Yeah, I think if you were to approach the random person on the street, uh, it would be this idea of seeing the future, of having some kind of key um, view behind the scenes, knowing and being able to predict something that's going to happen. And it's an important part of some prophet's teaching, but we can think of maybe the back half of the book of Daniel, for instance, telling us what's going to happen in the future, maybe not in the most straightforward way, but there you go. Um, but that isn't the only role of prophet, as we heard across the room. Some might argue that's actually not even their main function. Prophets in the Old Testament were a key instrument that God used to call out both nations and individuals when they had sinned. The prophets are, if you like, God's agents that he sends to rebuke the unrepentant. And at this point, you might be saying, well, how do you know that this is a prophetic statement? Well, our first clue is in verse 20, suggesting that Jesus was, quote, denouncing the towns that did not repent. Okay, well, maybe he's just telling them off. But we get an even bigger clue in verse 21. He says, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe isn't really a word we use today. But to any of Jesus' listeners, it would have immediately made their heads jolt up. Woe is a distinct term that is only used by prophets in both the Old and New Testaments. And they used it to call out both nations and individuals. The Old Testament scholar R.E. Clements writes that woe is an intense outburst of invective. Invective is scholar speak for particularly strong language. Directed against wrongdoers, conveying a note of threat, which is then more fully spelled out in the pronouncement that follows. So there's kind of a set rhythm, there's a set expectation from a prophet. And so you can see that there are stages here, according to Clements, and we can see both of those in our passages here. In both sections, Jesus says, woe to you, city. And then he talks about the miracles that city witnessed. And then says that in light of witnessing these miracles, they should have repented. Then he compares them to an unfavorable city, a city that they would hate to be associated with, and says that these rival cities would have certainly repented if they've witnessed those kind of miracles. So what's the goal of these prophetic call-outs then? To bring about change, to bring about repentance. The passage suggests that the miracles Jesus performed were not just about demonstrating his authority, 
They weren't just about healing people's ailments. They were ultimately trying to call God's people to repent and to turn to Jesus. This is a prophetic passage, and it's also ultimately about repentance. What do I mean by repentance? It's a bit of a loaded word, isn't it? Well, it's the kind of thing you might imagine a street preacher shouting into a megaphone. There's some cultural baggage here, I think. And before you make up your mind about what Jesus is saying here, I think we need to pull back to get some idea of what cultural and spiritual ideas Jesus' listeners would have had in listening to him. Repentance is a concept that runs throughout the whole Bible. From the earliest pages of the Old Testament, we can see that God has expectations for humanity. He establishes a law for them. And yet, they break God's laws. But God didn't leave them to wallow in their own self-destruction. He made a way for them to acknowledge their sin, to find a way back in the right direction. And it's worth noting that the Hebrew word for repentance, uh, several of you caught it, the Hebrew word for repentance literally just means to turn. Um, It conveys the idea of a course correction, uh, to get off the wrong path and back onto the right one. And the Jewish people had well-established rituals for repentance. There's a personal element to this, confessing sin to God. King David gets himself into a terrible mess. He's confronted by the prophet Nathan, and he finally exclaims, I have sinned against the Lord. But there's also a capacity for forgiveness built in as well. The prophets aren't wishing punishment on people. They're calling for them to repent because they can receive forgiveness from God. Look at what the prophet Isaiah says. This is Isaiah chapter 45. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. But remember that prophets aren't just Old Testament figures. Think back a few chapters in Matthew to the teachings of John the Baptist. We have fairly few words recorded for from him, but what are they? When we meet him back in Matthew 3, he comes out of the wilderness with a message. And what does he say? The first thing he says is, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. You see, Jesus isn't just a teacher. He's not just a new spin on a rabbi. He's taking on the mantle and the language and role of a prophet. And his language that he uses here would have been instantly recognizable to his Jewish listeners. The reference to sackcloth and ashes, again, is part of what the Israelites would do when they wanted to designate themselves as being in a period of repentance. Now, you might be thinking, okay, Jesus is trying to get these people to repent, but what's so special about the cities that he lists out? Well, actually, not much. They aren't significant places in the broader uh, world The cities that Jesus calls out are insignificant little fishing villages on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. What we need to know about these places is that they're the places where he has evidently been ministering over the previous time period. We don't get lots of information about Chorazin, but we get a little more information about Bethsaida. John 1 tells us that it's the hometown of three of Jesus' disciples, Philip, Andrew, and Peter. We know that he performed miracles there, but the people didn't repent. So in calling them to repent, he compares them with the cities of Tyre and Sidon. What are Tyre and Sidon famous for, you may ask? Well, honestly, the first thing is probably snails. (laughs) Uh, It sounds crazy, but it's true. Uh, You know that purple is the sort of royal color, and purple was rare. Purple was rare because the only way to reliably get purple dye in the ancient world was to take these little sea snails and milk them. And so that was uh, not the most fun job, you might imagine, but this is what this city is famous for. I don't think Jesus was referring to the snail industry in Tyre and Sidon. Because historically, Tyre and Sidon were also well-known cities that worshipped the god Baal, Baal. Uh, And they spread the worship of Baal into the Israelite kingdom. 
Israelites began to turn away from their God. And they started to worship Baal instead. And it reaches a point where Ahab, the king of Israel, decided to marry the princess of Tyre, a lady called Jezebel. More, intermar- more intermarriages came in time, and many Israelites, as a result of these continuing partnerships and relationships with the cities of Tyre and Sidon, began to worship Baal instead of God. For faithful Jews, these events that Jesus is describing here, and these associations he's making, are part of the, one of the most painful chapters of their spiritual history. It's a painful memory. It's a cultural wound. It's one of the most shocking comparisons that someone could make, though perhaps the most shocking one is the next one that Jesus levels. Because in verse 23, he turns his focus to Capernaum. Now what's significant about Capernaum? Actually quite a lot. It seems to be the primary base of operations for Jesus during his teaching ministry. I think there's a misconception because so much of the studies of Jesus focus on what he's up to in Jerusalem in the last days of his life, we forget that actually most of his ministry was on sort of little villages around the Sea of Galilee. Um, Now, Capernaum, we've got at least half a dozen accounts of Jesus healing people there. There's also references to him teaching in the local synagogue. So surely if anyone would have been aware of and transformed by the message of Jesus, it would be them, right? Well, apparently not. Jesus calls them out as well, and he follows a similar but not identical pattern to the previous verses. He calls them out, and he then compares them to the ancient city of Sodom. If you're not familiar with Sodom, it was a city that is the primary uh, location in the Bible in Genesis 18 and 19. We're going all the way back to the birth of Israel, the time of Abraham and his cousin Lot. To summarize a long and frankly particularly tough story, uh, God sends two angels to the city and they discover that the city is filled with wicked men. Genesis 19.4 is quick to say that all the men of the city, both young and old, were in on an attempt to sexually assault these messengers from God. These angels help Lot's family escape and then Judgment infamously rains down on the city for its wickedness. There's images of God throwing down burning sulfur and leveling, flattening the entire city. Sodom and its neighboring sister city, Gomorrah, became cautionary symbols of defiance against God and the judgment that they received. So we're looking at a prophetic passage about repentance because the day of judgment is coming. And that brings up a really potentially uncomfortable question. What is Jesus talking about with regard to the day of judgment? Again, he's using language that would be clear to his Jewish listeners, but it might get lost in the translation. The day of judgment turns up at various points in both the Old and New Testaments. And it's focused on something that will happen in the future. It's not happened just yet. That God, who is the only perfect and holy being in existence, will judge all men and women. Now, how does this sit with you? If I might hazard a guess, this is a bit of an uncomfortable thought. We don't like the idea of being judged. I don't like the idea of being judged. But what can we say about the day of judgment that Jesus is talking about here? Three ideas. First, we can say that God is a perfect judge. Our own judicial systems are imperfect, and I say that with apologies to those in those professions. I'm not trying to sling mud at lawyers and judges, but they're not perfect. I think we can all agree Judges aren't perfect, and indeed the laws are written by fallible people. At the very best, we can commend men and women in these roles as they try to restrain evil in the society around us. But also, we know all too well that this is an imperfect world with sinful humans in it, and too much falls through the cracks. You see, I think that each of us really longs for justice. It's impossible to listen to the news and not cry out for justice. 
I think of this poor woman and her children in South London attacked with some sort of acid-like substance. The perpetrator still on the loose, as of last I heard. As a husband and as a dad, it's both chilling and it makes my blood boil. We want justice. We want offenders to be caught and restrained, removed from a context where they can hurt more people. And then there's those who seem to have gotten away with heinous crimes. In the last few years, we've heard more and more of people who spent decades perpetuating and perpetrating horrific crimes, seemingly evading all possible punishment. It's only after their death we become aware of what had gone on behind the scenes. Well, this day of judgment that Jesus is talking about, it guarantees that every single man and woman will have to stand before a holy and perfect judge, an all-knowing judge, a perfectly fair judge. Now, you might think, well, I'm probably okay in the grand scheme of things. If I'm in the dock and, you know, Adolf is over here, I'm probably going to emerge okay, right? But friends, that's not how it works. One of the worst things that has ever been associated with Christianity in this country and around the world is that it's about being a good person. And that being a good person is all you have to do in this life. Now, don't mishear me. I'm not telling you to go out and be jerks. <laughs> what I'm saying is that Christianity is not and has never been about being a good person, about doing your good deed for the day. It's actually the opposite, realizing that if Jesus is who he says he is, that there will be a day of judgment. And while it's all well and good that Adolf will face judgment, so will I. Now, I've never committed genocidal human atrocities, you will be glad to know, but I've definitely broken God's law. Some of the things... I've been able to put right with the people I've hurt. Some of them I haven't. Some of them live just inside my head. The writer of Ecclesiastes finishes his book with a particularly telling line. He writes, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. It's not just my outward life that matters, the one that I show to others. My innermost thoughts and my innermost failures are also going to be judged. But this is the beauty of Jesus' teaching. God knew that we couldn't measure up. So he sent Jesus to be our representative on earth, born fully human. He lived the life we couldn't live, where Adam and Eve failed. Jesus triumphed. We can stand before God, not because we eventually cleaned up our acts, but because the punishment for our sins was carried by Jesus on his cross. That's what we'll celebrate later tonight at communion. It's a somber thing, and it's a glorious thing. Jesus came to earth, as the church fathers put it, for us and for our salvation. And God has graciously delayed his judgment of the world to leave the door open for more people to come in. So I'll close with this. Have you repented? Or are you trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps? God is holy. He's a perfect judge and nothing will get past him because he's perfectly fair. But through Jesus, he's made a way for us to come to him as our father. So my question for you is simply this. Will you repent of sin? Not to me, to God. Will you repent of wrong you've done and thought about in your life and throw the burden of all that off your shoulders? Will you repent and will you believe that Jesus has made a way back to God on your behalf? His arms are open and you can run to him. Don't make the mistake that the people in these cities did of witnessing God at work and then not repenting. I've said a lot here. We're going to take a moment to reflect as musicians come up. And if you have questions, please feel free to pop them into the app. Uh, you can use the website above. And if you'd rather not type something out, feel free to catch me afterward. I'd love to talk to you. But uh, yeah, let's just take a few minutes to reflect.
we were just going to sing um, one final song. Um, yeah, just um, thinking about what Tom was sharing with us there. Um, and this song, it's a bit of a, of a story, really, coming from the um, perspective of someone who uh, has been turned away from God but um, has come back to him. And maybe we can join with them in singing this um, in turning to Christ and uh, declaring that all we have is, is him. Um, so let's stand and sing.
Hallelujah. Take a seat. Wonderful. Thank you, musicians. Thank you, Tom, for your, your talk there. Uh, we're going to take a, a few minutes to have a look at some questions that people have asked. Um, so uh, if you haven't had a chance to uh, get on Slido the, on the, the app or the website, um, then do that. Do go on there, ask questions, and vote up questions that you'd like to be asked. Um, but first of all, uh, so, so Tom, could we go on to the first question, which is, um, what does repentance actually look like? So turn around doesn't help very much because you don't actually mean turn around. Um, how should I actually repent? A few related questions, kind of what, what are patterns of repentance as a Christian? Yeah. Uh, what, what does it actually mean for, for, for people now? Yeah. Thanks, Ed, and thanks for everybody who asked that. I think we mentioned the kind of Old Testament idea where there's big processes, there's sackcloth, there's ashes, you have to wear some different clothes, these kinds of things. I think that in Jesus, repentance takes on a very different form, and it's most honestly coming to the point where you realize that we need to say sorry to God or we need to say sorry to one another. There's, there's a vertical dimension to repentance, and there's a horizontal one as well, um, where we've, we know we've hurt someone, we know we have not treated them the way we should. And so I think, um, specifically to address the vertical one, I think it's just simply showing that you're aware that you've not measured up, you're aware that you've um, hurt God, um, and you ask for forgiveness. You say, God, I'm sorry. Because um, the beautiful thing is, repentance in that instance between us and God is always um, combined in the New Testament with this idea of belief. Um, and so it's not just saying sorry, but saying actually I believe all these things about Jesus are true. And because I believe all those things are true, I can know that these things can be dealt with. Mm. Yeah, because I guess if they're not true, then you're not really doing anything of, of value because it's just it's meaningless. But if, it, if you actually believe it to be true, yeah. uh, then you're actually able yeah. to turn away and, and live in that power yeah, of, of, of a new life given yeah. to us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Um, how can it be considered just for Jesus to be judged in my place? If this happened in our legal system, we wouldn't consider it just. Yeah. Um, I think what's helpful to consider is we're not just talking about a different legal system, but a different law. If God's law were in charge here and the judges were perfectly fair, we might as well just build up a uh, fence around the entire nation because we would all uh, have not measured up. We'd all be guilty, right? So if the standard that God has set is different than anything that could possibly exist on earth, um, I don't think the comparison necessarily um, is a one-to-one. -one. And so I'm not knocking, I'm not saying we need to establish a theocratic law here. I think what we have um, in our legal system is an attempt to restrain evil. But what we can see God is up to is something bigger. It's something that um, pushes against different understandings of what is uh, just in society. We can see it in different ways. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's just that Jesus is judged in our place, ultimately because I trust that that is the system by which God does it perfectly. And so I think that would be what I would say. Do you have any thoughts, Ed? Yeah, I think really helpful what you were saying there. Is it, it's not about uh, just, restri just restraining email, but actually delivering us from email. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so it's a diff almost a different thing yeah. going on, even though our, our justice system pictures it in some way, it's not the, the, big, yeah. the big picture. Um, and, and, we, and he delivered us from evil, as you were saying, by our repentance and faith mm -hmm. in Christ and yeah. what he has done. Um, so yeah, wonderful. <coughs> Thank you. Last question. Um, how do you milk snails? <laughs> uh, carefully. <laughs> um, well, lucky for you, I've actually got a snail. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I haven't got a snail for you, sorry, but carefully, okay. Uh, if you want to ask more about that, speak to Tom afterwards. Um, Tom, before we um, finish up, can you give us a kind of headline idea for what, what this passage was about? Yeah, that Jesus performed the miracles he did. He taught the teaching he did because he wanted us to repent of sin and turn to God. And through his cross, he made that possible. So. Great. Thank you, Tom.